So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by the delightful Vinny Podestivo, um, who is an Emmy award-winning media advisor and creator economist. And we've just been chatting about how that all came about and it's a fascinating story, so I can't wait for Vinny to share that with us. Hey, welcome to the show, Vinny. Oh, thanks for having me. Thank you. Oh, look, no, having just had a quick chat beforehand, I know they've got so much stuff we can share. So I'm going to ask you to start by sharing a bit of your story, because your story is a, is a really interesting one. And of course, yeah, you've just recently won an Emmy, which um, for most of us is, is way beyond our wildest dreams. So tell us a bit about that. That's fun. Well, there's, yeah, well, it sure is an interesting story now that we can give context and we can shape our history, you know, based on our successes and failures that we've been through. I was lucky, though. I went to school close to Stat- uh, in Staten Island. Uh, close to Manhattan. I always wanted to be a Broadway producer. I wanted to be surrounded by talent. I was lucky to be b- born and raised in New York and, and like literally like just gifted with surrounding myself. Actually, I was going to say gifted with talent, but I didn't have the talent. Everyone else had talent around me. <laughs> and as a kid, I was yeah. the kid I would get in trouble if I hung out with the five bad kids. So I started hanging out with the five most talented people. And to be honest, it made me want to get into casting. One night at school, Uh, My senior year, October 1998, my senior year in college, I took out an ad on something called Backstage. Um, This is a platform. Then it was a newspaper for people who didn't have representation. Non-union actors, dancers, comedians would be looking for casting notices here. And I said, if you are looking for future opportunities, please send your headshot and a resume to me, Vinny Padestivo. (laughs) one campus road student box 577 like i didn't even have my i didn't even have like an llc in mind i had no (laughs) understanding of the structure of business by the way i knew at that stage though that day i knew that i was going to launch this company mostly it's funny looking back now i knew i had to launch a company so i could do the services that i wanted to do i knew that i needed a construct and a structure to be able to operate independently, especially in the 90s where healthcare wasn't made available individually. And a lot a lot of the way that we as freelancers or, or in this gig economy can work now, a lot of that infrastructure wasn't available to plug in on a, on a non-business level back then. And I, I had this corporate sort of mentality. I, I loved processes. I was obsessed with economics and SOPs and the understanding of a process and how, how the alchemy of all parts of that process really could impact all of it. And to be honest, I, I was a data guy. Uh, <laughs> by way of, of Microsoft Access and Microsoft wow. Excel, I, I, you know, I, I let the macros do the work you know, for me. And I built this database. Mm-hmm. I built this database where I started using it to stay in touch with those 700 people that sent me in a result of, of putting out that ad. And that action of building community ultimately left what was the small little world of of the internet back then and a producer from Fox News, a brand new news network in the 90s, uh, found out that I was in casting and had this database and I had the ability to identify and manage and communicate with large scales of people. So as an audience coordinator, that was really valuable to them. They had a show called Hannity and Combs, uh, a show that sort of uh, talked about politics from a truly and fairly both sides of the aisle um, back then. So it felt really cool to be in the room, in the middle, very young, impactful, knowing that I'm responsible for getting the people in the room. And then they started letting me, because I was working with people as they were coming in, they started letting me, um, I didn't realize this was producing, but they, they started letting me pick the people who were asking questions. And then I knew what types of questions were coming from certain types of people and what those follow-ups were just because I was talking to them, curious, and also, I don't know, socializing, I guess. Networking, we would say now, looking back, but I was socializing then. I had you know, no goal other than just to make sure everyone around me had a great time. I knew that if, if I can keep the energy, ener- if I can keep it energized, creative output, that that's going to help impact the content in a, in a far greater way. And that led to MTV News, and um, from MTV News, I stayed at MTV for ten years, and I got to Ooh. find some of the biggest news anchors on on CNN right now, and ABC, and CBS, um, and NBC, and it's like the cool. It's the coolest. It's been the coolest ride, uh, and I think I take it. I took advantage of being a New Yorker. I took advantage of not knowing a single person in this industry, but but figuring out how to meet people, and and I systematized that. 
And, and right, I yeah. have used that every year to be in, and I talk annually a lot because I, I like identifying the space that I've, I've won one Emmy for one year on my 25 years of being <laughs> in media. The best part about it is it was last year. So it's just my first. Yeah. And now that I that's figured fun. out the way to win awards is by applying that that's half the battle. And if, if there's any business that's out there now, if you're looking as a way to to reinvent or reestablish, to expand market voice, to uh, maybe present authority, award, awards are, there are so many awesome awards that are out there for many types of businesses and the actions that those businesses take, uh, websites, emails, tech stacks, podcasts. Uh, there's so many ways to stand out in this creator economy. And, and those awards end up being, you know, uh, tentpole moments, flag, flags waving in the air for people looking for them. It's a great I – I don't want to really focus too much on the economy of podcasts, more so how this podcast economy is fracturing the market and, and how we – and what I know specifically being an independent creator now and 20 years or 25 years of, of uh, ad-driven commercial public media – what I've learned, what I what I've learned, and what I've seen, what we what we spent money on, what we don't have to spend money on, the the processes that help make sure that we're being true to brand, and that can we can actually scale when it's time to scale, um, and that we're setting ourselves up for success on that. Mm, that is awesome. So I'm really really fascinated because I work with a whole bunch of entrepreneurs. They they own established businesses. We talk to them about the fact they have to put systems and processes in place, and we talk about you know taking the core processes and actually um, systemizing those so you can humanize the potential of the business. So people haven't got to worry about the basic stuff. But most entrepreneurs look at me in horror and go, oh, but you know I want to be creative. That uh, this is going to stifle my creativity. And yet you're saying that you're absolutely obsessed with processes, and you are in probably one of the most creative in industries there is so tell me yeah. a bit more about that and tell me why you know what what how does it work for you why do you love yeah, it's process? two things it's, it's like creative boundaries because that's actually going to allow me to have an, an export so creative boundaries are important to me um mm -hmm. also rules are important to me because uh if i'm not breaking them then i don't know if i'm if expanding my boundaries so <laughs> so processes are brilliant because sometimes you know it's not working the way you need to because there's a new way to scale um, for example, you may have a blog, that blog might be connected to social media afterwards. So you might publish a blog and then most likely the way that we amplify that blog is it goes to social media. And yeah. what I'm here to say is to create a better process. Your blog, if, if you, you know, RSS, r really simple syndication, this idea of podcasters know it because we understand the, the podcast RSS blogs have RSS feeds too. It's weird to say this, but like blogs were first. <laughs> Podcasters just did it louder. <laughs> but blogs have an RSS feed. I take my blog RSS feed and I uploaded it to Google. I have a Google News verified blog RSS feed. Every single episode of my podcast that I'm doing that's published yeah. as a blog on my website is also going to Google. So if you go to news.google.com, I'll be a listed source on Google. Mm -hmm. And I have other websites now pulling my RSS lead. At one, I got discovered on Google News in a way that that is meaningful because the, R, the way the RSS works, and just to let me explain it, I write a column called Featured Podcasters, and I publish a new featured podcaster every day. And I and then there's a couple of other columns that we write on my, on my blog as well. Featured Podcast, Featured Podcaster, Top 5, um, a podcast news. So, so I stay in my verticals, but I have separate mm -hmm. RSS feeds for all of those because I know different websites want different things. So I have lots of people, pod, I have lots of platforms now pulling my featured podcaster um, RSS. To me, that's exciting because that's us. And, yeah. and I created this blog. I put the, you know, I've created the blog in a way that puts the podcaster's name in the H1 header of the feature snippet mm. of what this article is. And then my blog is published on Google News, Bing PubHub, Yahoo News, Flipbook, Apple News. Um, and, and, and I'm actually trying to tap into uh, LinkedIn, has a brilliant oh, yes. AI technology. They, the, the nickname is Mint, mentioned in the news. And what mm -hmm. I'm figuring out is how to publish a podcast article through my verified RSS feed that I know is now hitting news sources, um, I have a short list 
of mag of e magazines and news art and websites that I know for a fact that LinkedIn is scraping to see if our names are on it because I've been observing in my feed if my friends get mentioned in the news. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to do is trigger the system, the LinkedIn system, so that all of my followers get notified that I was mentioned in the news instead of me trying to put a post out push, and then socializing it. And, and I set myself up as a source. And that's something, by the way, anyone who's publishing five blogs or, or more per month. So if you have like one podcast per week, this is something that you can be doing that increases your publishing. And then Ooh. from all of those publishing platforms, like publishing is where we go to, well, publishing is where we create our content. Distribution is where we go to play it. So I'm talking about like news distribution now. From all of those distributors, social media is then amplified. As opposed yeah. to from my website or from yeah. probably probably from Instagram and then it's probably repurposing content, which is also mm -hmm. a trigger word for me. Repurpose. This word. Okay. This word of surprise. Repurpose to me. Hmm. <clears throat> it's now, like, go on, are me, you why, surprised? Why, it, why, do, why does it trigger you? Go on, tell me, tell me a little <laughs> bit more about what are you, that. What are you going through? Well, are you surprised that you have to advertise your podcast commercial every single time? Like, Because <laughs> repurposing is kind of like, you know, what we would say polishing a turd or yeah. throwing a ribbon on, so, you know, re repackaging a gift. If you could pre-purpose, which we do in television, I can't deliver a 30-minute show of the Osbournes without delivering five different sets of 30-second commercial spots, a 15-second commercial spot, a five-second commercial. And that, by the way, that was 20 years ago. Now I imagine with the digital lay, lay I can't even imagine what those those mandates are for deliverables are now for TV because of because TV, you know, the TV, TV networks, let, want, they let the production company do all of the work, but unfortunately it's a lot of output now versus mm -hmm. the good old fashioned, here's a, here's a 30 minute show. But in TV, we know one, we have advertisers or sponsors we have to support, but we also know we have real estate and other collateral off network, on network. We know we have holes that we have to fill that are a certain length. And, and pre-purposing, identifying that I need to have a 45-second audio spot or a 30-second video clip that I can be using to help me get this message out. If I can put that into the alchemy of the project, if I can create that while I'm creating us, yeah. this core piece of content, then, then I'm, I'm really being mindful of the audience that ultimately this is going to be advertised to, which is like, that's the growth audience. That's an important yeah. audience. You know, for us, that's that's really how important it is to pre-purpose. And when you pre-purpose, it allows you to build relationships with meme accounts on the. So maybe you reach out to a couple of meme accounts on Instagram that have ten million, and say, "Hey, every single month, I sit down with these types of people. What can I, what could I be giving you that would be of value to you?" Mm -hmm. And and it allows you to have that ongoing relationship again because you're you're supporting this conversation and you're presenting yourself as a source. Not as a story. If you want to leverage, and by the way, I can point to every late night talk show, right? Now that I just said, think of every, I think of every Jimmy Fallon skit ever that you're like, you watch, you go, oh my God, that's going to be hysterical. I can't wait for it. You even say it. I can't wait for it to be on Instagram tomorrow so I can share it. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's where it's going. That's how the public sector of media is leveraging its time and money to create assets that flourish in the private sector and the, the social sector of media, mm -hmm. which is social media. And then here's the killer part. And here's what Bravo is doing. If you want to just understand the impact of a brand, uh, Bravo basically controls if the housewives may or may not do appearances on podcasts. So the po housewives have to get approval from Bravo, which means yeah. Bravo's controlling which podcasts those women can go on, which also means they're supporting those podcasters and podcasts that they do. And, and in fact, probably enhancing their visibility. And think about this. If there's one season of Housewives, it's 24 hours, roughly, not, not including content, not including commercial, but say it's 24 <laughs> hours of content that Bravo is producing. How many thousands of hours of content are they now getting podcasters to create for them? And that's the level of, of pre-purposement that I'm talking about. When you, when, you, when you say, we've got something valuable, podcasters want it. They spend all this time and money. And by the way, it's not even about time and money. And passion and mm -hmm. purpose 
And, you know, all of the things that, pod, you know, look, there's a lot of easy ways to create <laughs> nowadays. Podcasters, we got to do research, publishing. Uh, it, it, there's so many steps to it. Um, not to say that it's, I wish it was as easy as posting on, on Instagram, but it's not as difficult, I want to say, as posting on Instagram. As it used to be. We're creating core yeah. content, right? Mm. So I get excited about that piece. And, 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 and for that. established yeah. businesses, established businesses creating core content, and I, I learned this from MTV, when you have executives, and I, I, I specialize really with founder-led businesses. So um, mm-hmm. those could be celebrity-owned businesses, a lot of QVC brands, pe- people who are empowered by the audience that they're supporting with their services and products that when, when I can get them to pre-purpose, when I can get that level of mindfulness up there, it trickles all the way down to department leaders, to the executors, to the managers. And, and it's a way to, it's a way to get company messaging out through your staff and through your personnel. It's funny through the talent that I love that they call employees of businesses now talent. It's so (laughs) cool. It's so welcoming and inclusive and like, (laughs) I told. I think I started this off by telling you. Well, I didn't tell you. Someone told me this, but someone told me I wasn't talented. So that's why I had to surround myself oh, really? with super talented people. Yeah, I was like, well, I gotta overcompensate then if I don't got it. I gotta, I gotta get someone star shine next to me. It's all star shine. So like, you don't know if it's coming for me as long as we're all bright together. And that's what I do. I keep that bright light shining, and I find new ways for people to stand out. I mentioned earlier awards are one of the ways can I just in this creator economy, can I drop one more quick um, tip that I'm like pretty passionate about? Oh, absolutely. Please. Yeah. Uh, It's a big one. Cause, cause um, in in television, it's, it's really prestigious to be an executive producer and in in film, it's, it's it's prestigious to be a producer and an executive producer. And I think that as I've worked in business, a lot of people who've left their companies sold and gone, you know, retired and gone public or have figured out, you know, have, have stepped away from it, often step into media. And usually there's some type of financial role they play. They're funding a creative element or they're getting something out there. They're empowering a production. The coolest thing about what's happening now, thanks to Amazon and IMDb, the internet movie database, like IMDb.com is a place where we go to check out who's in our TV shows, who's in our films, and podcasts are a viable intellectual property, a viable form of IP that deserve and can earn credit on IMDb. And this is big because this creates a, this creates dozens of link backs and data points that do not exist if you are creating podcasts. For example, you can upload your production company. You mm-hmm. will not only have your own profile in IMDb, which is where like local news goes to see who are the people talking. So like if you're a lawyer, this is a great example of why you should want to be on IMDb because local news is looking for great lawyers who are articulate, not great TV hosts who might have legal backgrounds. Like that was kind of like two years ago in the real yeah. people economy. Now it's the creator economy. So the level of the level of trust switch. This, again, I might be overgeneralizing, but just based on uh, if I'm investing in the next six to twelve month brand strategy, I'm hearing that from bookers at the Today Show at GMA on on, uh, on local and, and national radio as well. So being an expert in your field and, and being identified as being well-spoken on a platform like uh, like IMDb is a great way to stand out. All of your guests get connected to your platform, awards you win, get credit to your platform, taglines, content, and it will change. Overnight, it will change your Google image search. Mm-hmm. I promise you if you're not on – it's easy to say this, but if you're not on IMDb yet, I will grow – grow your visibility by like 40 million percent (laughs) kind of like as the entry point if you're on it a solid 10 to 20 million if you haven't updated your imdb profile recently and every single time there's a late night show and there's a celebrity appearance on those late night shows those late night shows have pas that go straight to imdb and list that appearance that's how important being listed on imdb for the creative actions that we're doing you know, have impact on our discoverability. And that's something you said it and forget it. That's evergreen and always on. And if you're connected to it, it'll always be feeding your visibility. 
So I had no idea because for me, yes, I use it all the time to sort of find out, you know, who's in the like in the TV show, who's in the film, when was mm-hmm. the film made, et cetera, et cetera. I had no idea about the broader kind of range of it. So that's really fascinating. And I love your example of a lawyer because I think that for a lot of people listening right now will go, well, but you're in the creative industry, you know, exactly. this is all great for you. How does this work for me? My business is professional services or a family run business, but it still has the same impact, right? I'll tell you what, I, I, as a pure creator, not as an advertising creator or a marketing creator, I stand out, I feel at least, I feel, or, or at least this is how I'm positioning my brand to be. So this is the way I feel. I feel like yeah. I stand out on LinkedIn right now um, because of my professional creative background, the level of productions I've worked on independent mm-hmm. and um, professionally. I feel like I stand out on LinkedIn, a business platform where produ- usually I would feel like, oh, I'm just the TV guy or I'm just the podcast guy or I'm just another person saying they have a podcast and I don't even talk about, you know, that. Um, And it's a way for me. I think that I'm, in other words, I think I'm exotic on LinkedIn. The same exact reason why I think lawyers are exotic on IMDb and bakers and and contractors and uh, architect. I mean, your specialty, this is the coolest thing. We, We go here, right? I'm telling you that the public sector of media looks at IMDB first. I'm going to be first probably if yeah. they want to book you directly to come on CNN, Fox, whatever, whatever is happening in the news and they need you, you know, that, that's a great place to be. And I, I'm a big fan of helping people get discovered. You, I, I put you under the nose of like the person who's looking to be really honest. Uh, you, I don't try to make people, I don't tell people to post a lot on Instagram. I don't think you need more visibility to increase your discoverability, you need more shareability to increase discoverability, but not visibility. Visi- increasing your visibility puts you everywhere all at once. If people yep. aren't sharing a simple presence of you, yeah, that's that's and that's that's something I can actually help any business do. That's something I realized we okay. were guilty of. I, I'm guilty. I was guilty of it back then. I was saying all these bad yep. stories. So how are people possibly going to say good things about me if I'm only giving mm-hmm. them? the bad stories and by creating these pieces it really changed it really changes how how people can share us a great example um around this holiday you'll you'll find something this holiday some toy some gadget something that you love and you'll buy six of them because it's the right price and more importantly yeah. it's going to allow you it serves your ego this this moment of discovery where you know you identified something that you can now bring to your secret Santa or your family or your siblings or however, however we do the holidays and give those presents away and, and know that you you were able to bring value and there's a, this discovery piece in it, right? And they'll get you that way. That's how they get you. That's a, five new things you've got to let your family know about. Be the one to get it. You want to be the cool aunt? This is the product you got. You know, they there's that ego piece. In, in discovery, sometimes discovery, we're so focused on us getting discovered. You know what I tell ca- uh, casting directors? I've been in a couple, I've been in some, like, back. I've been in the background of like the Irishman, Sex in the City, and the Thomas Crown Affair, by the way. Yeah. Every single time, <laughs> it was the coolest, the coolest movies ever, by the way. Yeah. Um, and every single time I met those people, I said, I'm going to get to do this, and you're going to be the person who discovered me, and I'm never going to forget. I'll never forget you for discovering me and giving me this opportunity. And I always say that in the castings <laughs> when I knew I really wanted something to happen because I, I was trying to say, like, this is – like, you're part of my story, and, like, if you if you want to be part of my story, here's – I'm giving you a big way into it, so much so that when I became a casting director, I leveraged that emotion – Mm-hmm. Oh, all the producers listening to this, <laughs> but I leverage that emotion. I would I would come into MTV and I would say, "Here are five people. Who's going to get them? Another network? You want Nickelodeon, Disney? Who's going to come in and get these five people that I know for a fact need to be on our air? We either get to claim that we launch stars, or we can just be serving pop culture. And, and no offense, but the ten years that I was at MTV, we we created some amazing game changing opportunities for people to. Yeah. Show you know we took the, MTV used to give artists three minutes to tell their story in music videos. I ran, we ramped that up to thirty minutes, sixty minutes. I said I, I did not mean to say I. Rod okay. Asa, my boss, my mentor, like the man who is everything. I would be zero in terms of having access to making the change that we got to make if it weren't for him. Uh, and it was his vision that really did it. But I get excited again about about knowing that when you create space and time, intentionality. 
when you're when you're purposeful about the content you're creating and how it will be shared, that all of that matters. And if you're looking to increase your strategy and increase your views or increase your top of funnel, or in, it all starts with creating the actual piece of content. Yeah. I mean, I always ask our guests to give three tips. We've already kind of covered naturally two of them. So pre-purpose your content, not not repurpose it because that's mm-hmm. not the right way to go. Get yourself onto IMDb. Even if you are a lawyer, a baker, whatever you might be, um, it's a great place for you to get picked up if you like. What mm-hmm. would be your third kind of key tip for the listeners? Every single person should be a podcast guest. There okay. is There is nothing that I'm creating, collaborating, or making at all, in my opinion, that is more valuable than getting to show up with value, a space where I get to be honestly and authentically myself and truly connect with somebody who I trust and share information with somebody like you, Deborah, who elevates it and amplifies it and distributes it and believes in it and we're part of it and not only is there an output on your channel as well this conversation affects the alchemy of what i'm creating and how i'm moving forward and there will be a conversation after this that where i ask you maybe one one of these days 100 days after it airs right after if this airs on your podcast maybe would you consider letting me have this episode and airing it on my podcast because i'll push as many people to you as possible and by the way when you are at the podcast, y'all better leave that five star review. Like I better see, <laughs> I better see this be the episode, Deborah, that gets us. Like I want, I want to see my friends' names on your five star review board, leaving you yeah. messages. That that's the level of energy that I know I can create. You know, as a podcaster and as a business owner, and and to be honest, um, I actually have very regimented times that I, I, I schedule to be a guest on podcasts. So mm-hmm. I'm not saying yes to everything all throughout the month. I have very locked in times. I maximize my time together. I'm not worried about the dogs, the kids, the the payroll, all other distractions. These are, these are my two hours a day that I know I can have output yeah. and it is so rewarding. And it, 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 it's a brilliant way for anyone, whether you have a podcast, don't have a podcast, you're thinking about a podcast, you don't know if you should have a podcast. If you being a, it's like being a Thanksgiving Day's guest. It's like you do the work, <laughs> yeah. you know, I got to know what's yeah. going on with, I got to know what's going on with mom and all the kids. I got to do my work and show up with my own plate of value. And, mm-hmm. and enjoy the space that I'm in and I can do that. And um, to be honest, it costs me nothing more than time. Yeah. And in this day and age where time is a luxury, what you're about to do with this episode is like 10x the amount that I could have if I was just, what, going to make a post about this topic. And I really, really can't stress how easy it is. I use Podmatch. I love Podmatch. Yeah. So yes, anyone yep. who's <laughs> listening to this, look in the show notes, click on Deborah's Podmatch. Um, link and please come join us. There's actually a book out now that I got to help create um, that how to maximize being a guest on podcasts. I really truly believe in it. Uh, 25 years ago, I was a guy at MTV walking around in the studio asking people if they asking artists if they wanted shows or opportunities, creating things just based on what I was hearing. I'm doing it now as a podcaster mm-hmm. and I'm doing it a lot on Podmatch. So if there's yeah. anything I can do to help you guys be successful in in your own personal brands, in your founder-led companies, or or even the infrastructure, the SOPs for internal mm-hmm. communication between executives, and maybe sometimes there's like a founder-led, uh, an executive and a row of talent that are public-facing also. So it's just understanding how to leverage, to be honest, like the face real estate, especially on social media, so that we can connect with people because like the power in people is rit- ridiculous. Podcasting is proof of it. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Hey, so we'll put a link to that book, obviously, in the show notes that people can actually Thanks. get to that book. Um, what about if people are feeling a bit nervous about going on a podcast? You know, I think you and I are obviously natural. We love to meet people. We love to, you know, um, find out what's going on. But for some people, they'll go, oh, but, you know, having to talk on a podcast could be really scary. What would be your advice to them? Okay. Um, my advice to them would be, well, first off, um, if you don't want to speak on podcasts and, and you're, and you don't feel comfortable and ultimately it's not the path that you're, is, is of interest to you, then mm-hmm. there are other directions I would go in. But if you're saying to me, oh, I wish I could do podcasting, but I just don't know if I'm good at it. I wish I could X, Y, you know, if, if, if you feel like there's that, this opportunity, um, mm-hmm. I would say two things. One is 
I don't know if you are as clear in what you want to share or what you want to talk about as you need to be. And I'm not saying you need global clarification. I think a lot of us have global clarification of what we're doing. It's these 45 minute, 15 minute, 30 minute only conversations in podcasting where time is crunched and we want to get as much value out there as possible, but know that if we confuse, we lose. So how important it is, as Deborah did, for us to stick to three. Trust me, there is plenty more <laughs> to learn, oh, but it, it's, yeah. I think that that's part of it. That was For me, that was part of it. Also, um, in, in podcast guesting, I have to be honest, it, it's with people. So I yeah. trust you. And I know that ultimately you have total control over this recording, but not some company or business. And I know that you're not, you can't say to me, oh, well, it's not my footage. Someone else took it and I don't really have control over it. That's, that's what happens in TV and in news. And that's the aha gotcha journalism piece that I think scares some people away from yeah. showing up live. And, and, and I think that one, clarity in, in what you want to say. And two, it's like tr trusting people. It's really what it is. It's for me. Because we're all about building each other up, right? So on a podcast, nobody wants to make anybody look bad. In fact, we want to do everything we possibly can to, to offer value to our listeners. So I think you're absolutely yes. right. It's not the same as being, I remember being on live radio once. I was so petrified um, yeah. because they do, they try and trick you. They try and sort of take you down a, a route. Whereas this is not what podcasting is about. It's about actually sharing um, the stuff that we know that we can know can help other people. And you start small, you know, and we have conversation. Like we talked for, like we've been talking for weeks, if not months, by the way. First off, I I, I, I think I <laughs> I can honestly say, yeah, I think I'm good at casting and like I trust the casting pro. I, there's so much though that happens when I send an invite to a podcast that I'm interested in being in. There's so, I'm inviting you into my world and I'm opening it up. Mm -hmm. I'm not showing up apprehensive or nervous about which direction you, we've done so much back and forth and I'm not stepping into an unknown territory with someone that I feel like doesn't have control over the conversation. So, so much of it is an individual process, you know, mm. for the people out there who don't know how to podcast, let me say it this way, focus on who, not how. Mm. Don't yeah. try to become better at podcasting, find someone to be better at podcasting with. And hey, I do that stuff. Like I pretend to interview people on my Zooms. I, I have something called the Creator Hub. Everything I talked about is documented. It's free. I have uh, clients that uh, they pay for master, uh, my software as a service clients that pay for master classes that I'm able to offset the cost of any membership for life. Mm -hmm. So anything I've talked about is uh, all the SOPs, every process that I've talked about, how to get your podcast on INV, those 99 awards worthy of winning, uh, how to get paid for having a podcast, by the way. There's about 50 creator platforms I strongly recommend you all put your names on. It's weird to wow. say this. You want to get hmm. paid from podcasts, put your name on the list where the checks are. And then they call you and they say, hey, you're, you got 200 people. This is exactly what I'm looking for. And you're like, what? Me? Really? Is this really in my – my, yeah, cause you got to be in it. To get yeah. selected and get picked it. And they're looking for us. Um, Amazon yeah. just launched something comparable, by the way, too, where, oh, okay. where Am the Amazon market is now leveraging access to brands and creators to um, make stronger connections in conversion. So, again, people, it's all about the who, not the how. Yeah. Awesome. And, and, and as you said, I mean, it's, it's like you've got to put your hand up. You've got to put yourself out there. Otherwise, it's never going to happen. And so that's how you got your your awards is by actually saying, hey, look, I'd like to win an award. Let me put myself forward for that. And, and same, I think, with podcasting and stuff too. Hey, look, we could talk for hours and hours and hours because um, I know we've got a lot in common. But in terms of people working with you, I know you've got all this free stuff and that is amazing. We'll make sure we put links to that. But if somebody actually needs some help, because for a lot of people who are running a business, their forte, their their thing that they love, their unique ability is actually, you know, running the business, being the visionary, being the integrator, whatever it might be. But they might want to actually get some help with this. How would they get that from you? Well, how do you work with people? Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I work one on one um, and I, I just launched my inner circle for creators. So whenever you're listening to this, it's launched, which is so yeah. nice to say. Um, <laughs> and, it, and, and to be honest, I took two years to figure out how to work in a group setting. I'm really, really good one on one. Like that, that I can, I know for a fact that I am the things that I can do with you as a solopreneur, as a founder led company. Uh, I have, I have $100 million brands that I'm working with that are dominating Sephora and Blue Mercury and QVC that have founder led faces at the profile of the company, but it still is about community. 
And how do you empower those ambassadors? How do you empower the, uh, the, the mentors? So, so, so it's a really custom, you know, basis. Uh, I, I look at, it's a lot of SOPs and processes. So Mm -hmm. I'm definitely going to look at something that I'm going to look at something and my prognosis will be sustainable. It will not be a quick fix. It'll be a permanent fix or at least a a structure of a way to set you up for success. Um, That ranges from how, you know, uh, for some clients I in here in New York, I've gone through their offices and I figured out where we can put a Instagram studio and converted that into a podcast studio and then converted it into a live hit studio for QVC so they can save time instead of having to go down to QVC from New York. They can save time doing that. Now that QVC lets people do live hits from high, from, so, so if you have, you know, so there's like unique data points that are in creativity. And I think I've, I've worked with certainly the one percenters, Ashton Kutcher, Sharon Osbourne, we got to put Beyonce in her first film, brought Mandy Moore. Wow. Like I've worked with the one percenter creators and I've yeah. worked with the one percenter business owners and we all have mm-hmm. the same issues, by the yeah. way. We, even the, the non-one percenter have the same issues too. <laughs> A lot of it is, is processes and on the understanding of, 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 well, by the way, the lack of a machine or the understanding of how the machine works or, or the plumbing of the machine thereof. Mm. So um, creative look, be cre- creativity is the act of scaling an idea, right? Yeah. It, it, cre- we create something is it's in my head, it's in your hands, we've created it. It's in your, it's in our minds, it gets in our mouths and it's out there, we've created it. And how I can help people scale, it's really an individual process depending yeah. on the, the scope and size of the business. Uh, okay. And then for people who um, don't have giant teams and aren't, you know, running 40, 500, you know, p- staff employees and, and working cool globally, um, I think my inner circle for creators is a, is a pretty solid uh, opportunity to learn how to, how to create content, who to create content with, how it could be distributed, how it could mm-hmm. be amplified, how it can be aggregated, syndicated. Like I throw in all my media words. Those are, that's money. Yeah. Syndication is money. Aggregation is money. Like there's, there are things that we're not doing with our privately owned content that networks do to make money that we just don't know about. And those are the, some of the little things that I know that I can help companies should. take on or the, or individuals take on as well. Like, as I said, <laughs> uh, a giant website or my personal tiny little website, as long as I've got a blog, I can be a Google news verified RSS yeah. feed. That's yeah, gigantic. That was, that was something I learned from this morning. So thank you very much. For that, that you want to know how discoverability on search engine result pages and SERP and Google and what's feeding those snippets that are popping up and knowledge panel information. We'll do another episode. Yeah, we <laughs> Just on discoverability will. alone. Yeah, right. <clears throat> I'm going to take you up <laughs> on that. Thank you so for you this. Better be, yeah, thank, thank you. you. So what, what's the best um, best way to get in contact with you? Is there a website? Is there you know, an email? Yeah, address? VPE. What do you, how do you like it? VPE.TV. Yeah, That's yep. it. And I'm on LinkedIn. Say hi. You don't got to wait till yep. the last minute to start the relationship. <laughs> you are beautiful. Yeah, no, I must admit, I've, I've, I've been a little bit distracted with um, my, my father passed away a couple of months ago. So I've been a bit busy kind of sorting that stuff out. And I'm actually recording from my home today, which is not normal. I usually do it in the studio. But um, when I actually finally got around to finding you on LinkedIn, it was like, oh my goodness, this man is amazing. I can't wait to talk to you. So yes, as, oh, as you thanks. said, don't leave it till the last minute. Get on there, have a look. <laughs> He's got some amazing stuff he can share. So hey, Vinny, look, thank you so, so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I've got one very, very quick last question. And I don't know if you'll like me for this, but you shared with me, you've obviously got an Emmy, which is really cool. You've also got a goat, right? What is a goat <laughs> award and what does that mean for you? <laughs> Shout out to Connor, the content king doobie yeah. of LinkedIn. It's literally the most brilliant thing. I mean, just it's just brilliant marketing. Um, yeah, next to my Emmy, I've got a, a cute little goat statue uh, with greatest of all times marketing king. And you know what? It's just a friendly, you know, I worked so hard for some awards last year and it was a really nice reminder of the power of people. Again, I fall on this line a lot. I don't know why. I really believe in it, though. It was a really cool gesture. And uh, I thought it was a brilliant piece of marketing collateral. And it reminded me of, first off, why networks even have award shows in the first place. Because people share when they win awards. Yes. So people feel good when they feel acknowledged and heard and you know, valued. And that was just a small little gesture of, of, from a friend. I've gotten Mousekers from Disney and I've gotten Moon Men from MTV, which <laughs> have a corporate vibe to them, albeit yeah. cool, but this was something pretty neat. And hey, it, uh, that's a good reminder. I'm glad you brought this up. A good reminder that we all could be doing that, you know, yeah. that we, we all could be 
creating our top fives and finding building stages where we can be the source for discovering and elevating people. That's a great, I love that little goat though. So my goat keeps my Emmy happy and I'm watching Yellowstone, which is all about Montana and the wild, wild west. So I have my own little I'm playing Barbie dolls at 45. You got it out of me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Like, I, I'm a big kid myself. I completely get it. Hey, Vinny, I've got to say goodbye. But hey, look, thank you so, so much for everything that you have shared. Um, a fellow Schnauzer owner as well, which is always yes. kind of fun. So we had our share of our dogs before. And mine's just joining me at the moment. Um, look forward to keeping in contact. And I'm definitely getting you back. So thank you for your time. And um, we'll thank talk you. again soon.